So, um, yeah, you know, a lot of people know me for my work in PGP, but um, the more fun work that I've done in the last uh, 12, 14 years has been on uh, secure VoIP. Uh, uh, secure phone calls are just more fun than secure email. Um, so much has changed. Um, and yet, we still find ourselves uh, having to argue about, well, what happens if bad guys use this technology? Um, we had to fight hard through the 90s to, to get the right to use strong crypto. And now it has become entrenched. And I don't think that we're going to lose it. But we are going to have to keep fighting for it because, um, you know, politicians keep having to deal with the public policy issues about what happens when criminals use this technology. So they keep asking for it. They keep pushing back. Um, I like to use the, uh, the story of um, Bonnie and Clyde, the American bank robbers that uh, did their activities about 100 years ago. Um, they used the automobile more effectively than any bank robbers had before. They would rob a bank, they would run out, jump in the car, and drive very fast across state lines, and the police couldn't chase after them in the US. And so the police had never seen bank robbers do this. They, they didn't know what to do. They were calling for cars to be built with smaller fuel tanks. Um, Clyde Barrow wrote a letter to Henry Ford uh, thanking him for designing such a fine automobile that was so important for his bank robberies. Um, so fortunately, uh, the, uh, the need to build smaller fuel tanks was not the, uh, that was not the argument that prevailed. Uh, bad guys will use new technologies uh, to commit their crimes. Uh, even, even important enabling technologies, like how important the car was to Bonnie and Clyde. Um, the 9-11 uh, the terrorists used GPS receivers to navigate, handheld GPS receivers. You know, the, the navigation systems on the aircraft were preset to find all the airports, so if you want to land at the airport, it knows how to find the airport. But you can't make them navigate to the World Trade Center or the Pentagon. Um, so they, they went there with handheld GPS receivers and made note of the location and used it to fly their aircraft to their targets. Um, what are we supposed to do with that? Do we stop building GPS receivers? I mean, that, was, that attack happened several years before the iPhone, before smartphones had GPS receivers built in. Imagine a world today where you could, didn't have location services on your phone. If we were to um, take the policy position that people shouldn't be able to use GPS because terrorists used it. So, you know, we hear them saying that they're, they're going dark, but they never had it so good. They're kind of in a, um, a golden age of surveillance. If you go back to um, the 1990s when we were fighting this out, um, you know, the surveillance picture at that time was, was far less capable than it is today. Today, we have ubiquitous traffic cameras in so many countries, and they're doing OCR scanning of license plates, and they can track the movement of all these vehicles, and they know where they go, they know where you go, who you meet with, the street cameras that, you know, that are millions of, of cameras that are in cities that have face recognition software so that they can look at a crowd of thousands of people walking by and identify all the faces in the crowd and keep track of you even when you're not driving a car, just walking down the street. They can monitor the movements of individual people. They can see who's going in and out of a hotel and f recognize all their faces. And, you know, even if you use a different name to check in at the hotel, they know who's checking in at the hotel, they know who's sleeping with who. 
you know, um, Russian, uh, Russian prosecutors that were investigating corruption um, when uh, Yeltsin was in power. Uh, there was a Russian prosecutor that was neutralized by uh, a sex scandal because they, they caught him in a, in a sting operation in a hotel in bed with two women that were not his wife. And they, <laughs> they destroyed him politically and they shut down his, inve his corruption investigation. And uh, uh, the guy who replaced him, the chief prosecutor today, is an extremely corrupt prosecutor. Um, perhaps some of you may have seen that video uh, that uh, Pussy Riot had about um, the uh, corrupt prosecutor. They, it, it's in Russian, so you can't really understand what they're saying, but they're, they're making this thing with flapping their hands. To, how many people have seen that video? No? You guys aren't Pussy Riot fans? No? Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, that video is about this corrupt prosecutor that, was, that replaced the one that was neutralized by this. And so this is a product of what, what happens when you have a surveillance society that's controlled by uh, an extremely corrupt government. It, they can get compromat on, on anyone who's investigating corruption. So we need to do whatever we can to prevent that kind of surveillance society. And, you know, we've, it's, we, we've kind of lost that. We have a surveillance society, and we need to... Um, and on top of that, we have, um, the, we have this situation that's developed uh, about cybersecurity that has become completely lopsided in favor of the attackers. For centuries, there's been an arms race between cryptographers and cryptanalysts. And, you know, for the, at different times in history, one or the other of them have been ahead. In World War II, the cryptanalysts were ahead. And this, you know, affected the outcome of the war. Uh, today, and for the past 40 years, it's the cryptographers that have been ahead. And when cryptographers feel like they can put their, uh, their opponents in a position to, have to, to force them to have to solve a difficult math problem, they think they've won. They, they feel secure that, oh, you know, it's going to take longer than the age of the universe for them to, to break this math problem, so we don't have to worry. It's a false complacency because um, when you look at the broader picture of cybersecurity, it's actually in favor of the attackers, not the defenders. And it's so lopsided in favor of the attackers that it's going to take us, I don't know how long, to catch up. Uh, the, the attackers will break into your computer and inject malware that will obviate the effectiveness of, of your, of your uh, uh, encryption software. If you're, even if you have a properly implemented uh, strong encryption software like PGP or, you know, uh, uh, signal or something like that. If if malware can in, be injected into your computing platform and can escalate its privileges and read all of memory and breach all the sandboxes, then they can exfiltrate your keys, and it doesn't matter how good your crypto is. Um, and that's what's happened, and the consequences of that have been enormous. We now have a White House that has been penetrated by the Kremlin because of the effectiveness of cybersecurity attacks. And it, it's not just intelligence gathering. It's, it's also, it's, it's now possible to, for them to exfiltrate sensitive material and weaponize it in elections and even break into election systems and affect the outcome of the election. I don't know how we're going to make it through the next election cycle, no one's doing anything in the U.S. because the president thinks it's not necessary to defend our election systems because, you know, the elections worked out pretty well for him last time. So, we're, we're at such a disadvantage that we need, to, we need to have a large number of engineers 
enter the workforce and focus their efforts on cybersecurity defenses. I, you know, I, part of that is, is, is to develop uh, the skills in attacking also, because to develop effective offenses, you have to understand how the attacks work. We need to scale up the, <coughs> the, whole, the whole field of cybersecurity. And at a time like this, when, we're, when we are overwhelmed by the effectiveness of the attacks, this is not the right time to be asking us to, 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 uh, to give up our, our strong crypto. Um, we need all the help we can get. Uh, if, we, if we're told that we need to put back doors in for, for strong crypto, then those back doors will be hijacked by the attackers. I've spent most of my career uh, building <coughs> uh, strong crypto that does that has no back doors, and uh, my, I mean my secure VoIP products have been used by Navy SEALs, and you know the arguments that well, what happens if uh, Al Qaeda or ISIS uses strong crypto? Well, you know what? Don't you want the Navy SEALs who kill Al Qaeda to also have strong crypto? I mean. <laughs> If it, if it has a back door, they won't use that. So that's where we find ourselves. We need to, um, we need to have a, 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 a huge escalation in the effectiveness of cyber defenses. Um, for the past several years, I, I've been working in Secure VoIP on uh, Silent Circle, a company I started uh, more than five years ago. Things have not worked out well for Silent Circle. Um, we made some uh, business decisions early on that undermined the network effect. You know, we charged money for the product. We didn't give it away for free. You can't get network effect without giving it away for free. Um, and so, without achieving that network effect, we couldn't get traction in the market. Um, I'd like to try, to, try it again. <laughs> only give it away for free the next time. Um, I want to do a, uh, another cyber secu uh, a, uh, another uh, secure in, uh, communications product. In fact, I, I'd like to do it open source, and I, I, I'm, I'm actually looking for uh, uh, skilled activist engineers that uh, are looking for an open source project to work on. I, if anybody wants to volunteer to work on secure communication products uh, that we can open source, I. Talk to me about it today after my talk. Um, so, um, let's see. How much? How much time before the the? That's to the Q and A. Okay. I've been living in Europe for the past few years. Uh, I, I lived in Geneva for for two years and then, uh, and then moved to uh, the Netherlands here. I live in The Hague since last uh, October. I, I kind of like being an expat. In fact, I'm more likely to remain in Europe now until things improve politically in the US. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't learned Dutch, but I'm more comfortable here than in Geneva because I was handicapped by my lack of French speaking skills. Um, so, <clears throat> so normally I, uh, you know, a lot of people wait to the end to, uh, to do Q&A, but I'm more interested in a conversation with the audience. Um, and so I'd like to open it up for questions to get things started along a, a more conversational track. Uh, if anybody wants to, to raise their hand and, and, yeah, you. If you have questions. Oh, there's a microphone right please there. Please come to the microphone, you thank you. Step up, step up to the mic. Hello. Ugh. Hello. I have a personal question for you. Uh, feel free not to answer if you feel like not answering it. Okay. As far as I've 
uh, known about your work uh, for the past 20 some years. Uh, the question I was always not been able to answer to myself is, are you related to Bob Dylan? <laughs> you know, I, I have an Uncle Bob, but he doesn't sing. <laughs> uh, no, Bob Dylan spells Zimmerman with one N and I spell it with two. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anina and I'm from 360 Fashion Network. I do fashion technology. And I'm well aware of, for example, the car companies specifically who are tracking you with, um, you know, cameras and so on. And so how can I build clothing that would be the, you know, invisibility cloak? Or how can we protect ourselves with um, technology that will uh, make the cameras and these tracking uh, make us unreadable? Do you have some suggestions? There are, I mean, look, there are some camouflage things that I've seen, you know, there's makeup that people sometimes wear to change the face recognition uh, uh, effectiveness. But I really don't think that's the solution. I, I think our solution is entirely in policy space. You know, you can deploy encryption software and, you know, have a technical solution there but you can't encrypt people's faces. Uh, for that, we have to work in policy space. We have to regulate uh, surveillance. Uh, we, we have to restrict how the surveillance data can be used. Uh, you know, Europe has a far more effective legal regime for protecting privacy than we have in the US. Most of the Western European countries have privacy commissions. We don't have anything like a privacy commission in the U.S. Um, this is, you know, th here you have dedicated professionals that go to work every day and work on protecting people's privacy as part of the, uh, the official government apparatus. That's a wonderful thing. You can expand the activities of the privacy commission in each of your countries if you, you know, if you pass laws, if you have, you know, I mean, the European Union is, is um, there's a position paper that was uh, published recently by an EU commissioner that uh, calls for no back doors in crypto. Um, you know, there's an example of uh, operating in policy space where you can make a difference. I mean, the, it's tempting to think only in terms of technology because most of us here are engineers. I assume that most of you are engineers, right? How many people here are engineers? Okay, that's good. So engineers make technology, and sometimes the, the deployment of technology you know, creates the conditions that, that then lead to policy changes. But I don't think that's gonna happen in the case of uh, pervasive video surveillance. That's something we need to work on entirely in policy space. You don't, you don't think there's any kind of um, device that one could wear or that there's a way to scramble the camera signals, et cetera, from a technical perspective. Scramble what? Scramble the camera signals from a well, technical perspective. Well, I have seen examples of people wearing LEDs on their hat that are infrared LEDs that shine very brightly and make, uh, make it hard for the camera to see your face. But that, that's not gonna protect the whole population. If we want to try to change the world, we need to have something that protects the whole population. Think of it this way. Imagine if you had developed a, uh, a vaccine to protect against a, uh, some disease, and, you were only, and, and only a few people were going to use the vaccine. It, it, that's great for those people, but that's a tiny fraction of the population. If you want a vaccine to be effective, you have to give it to the whole population. We don't have, we can't have everybody wear hats that have infrared LEDs blinding the cameras. I mean, technically it's nice, but then the engineers that build the cameras will modify the, the camera's sensitivity to not see the infrared, and then the cameras will work again. And then there'll be another countermeasure and another counter countermeasure. And we need to resolve that, I think, in policy space. I agree with you, but in the interim, if the drug, for example, using your existing, you know, can, we, uh, that can we let everyone ask questions, please? 
I just think that there's a must be a two-way solution because in the short term you have to deal there are, with there it. are technical the solutions to the... certain aspects of video uh, surveillance I mean I mentioned one of them but those are yes you can get that you can I've seen people put infrared LEDs on their hats and it works you know I actually saw through the camera and saw that it really does work but that's not going to protect the population Hello. Um, I work on Secure Drop, which is the software developed by the Freedom of the Press Foundation, Snowden's Foundation, to protect the journalists in extreme cases, to allow them to communicate with their sources yeah. in a secure and anonymous way. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, uh, do you have an idea about the technology that would improve that kind yes. of scenario? Yes. Uh, secure communication, it, 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 there's, there's several layers of that problem that you have to address. To protect the content of the communication is easy. You know, we can protect the content of email with PGP. We can protect the content of phone calls with, um, with stuff that I've developed, silent phone, or, or you know, WhatsApp has, has, uh, has a VoIP encryption feature that, that is secure. Uh, Signal has a really nice uh, capability of protecting both text and, and voice. Um, there are several products that do that. Um, but that's good just for protecting the content. But one of the, one of the most important elements of, of helping journalists collect information from whistleblowers is the whistleblowers are terrified of being prosecuted for you know, revealing their information. Uh, in some countries, they're worried more than just being about than just being prosecuted. They're worried about getting killed. Um, so, in that case, traffic analysis becomes important. Um, it isn't enough to protect the content because if somebody works, let's say, at a government in a government office and they see things that are not appropriate, and they try to communicate it to, let's say, the New York Times, then uh, the fact that there's encrypted communication between someone who works in a classified environment and a, a journalist for the New York Times, that, that communication, even if encrypted, may be enough to focus attention on that whistleblower and, and then they can develop in, other investigative activities around them to find what he did and then prosecute him. Um, you may recall there was a, a recent um, incident where <coughs> there was a, um, someone in, and I think an NSA contractor that printed out some documents on a, on a color printer and gave them to a journalist. And the, the, the printer had some um, watermark technology that revealed where the printer printed. And <laughs> Anyway, even without that, they probably could have caught her. Um, so traffic analysis is very difficult to defend against. And in fact, it can be so difficult that it's, it's I usually don't even try because it's just too difficult. Um, what, what you can do is, I mean, you specifically asked about whistleblowers. Whistleblowers are a special case because they usually, first of all, they, they're working in environments that are tech, tend to be tightly controlled environments, you know, because they come across information that is something that they want to give to a journalist. They're probably working in a, in a place where it's either classified or it's, or, you know, it's in, maybe in government policy areas that they're seeing something scandalous and they want to reveal it. And those kinds of environments tend to favor traffic analysis, you know, because they access some, some computer networks. They, you know, they'll, they'll copy some files onto a memory stick, for example, and they'll be monitoring software that detects that. And then they send it and, you know. So there's traffic analysis happening on multiple levels. And that's where the biggest danger is to whistleblowers. The content protection is a, is a solved problem now. If you go to the New York Times or other uh, mainstream press organizations, you'll find 
that many of them have websites that have a page you can go to. Do you have information for the New York Times? Here's how you can give it to us. They'll give their PGP key. They'll, they'll give you their signal, you know, how to reach them on signal. Um, the New York Times used to use my software, Silent Phone, but, you know, we never, <laughs> we got, we never got the network effect that we needed, so. Um, but, you know, the, I mean, tr he, here's a... Uh, but the other things that journalists need, it, it isn't purely a whistleblower thing. Journalists also operate in dangerous environments. Uh, for example, there was a journalist for a, 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 a major American newspaper that was operating in Damascus and using a cell phone to, to call, call her office uh, to report on the war. And she was just speaking English on a normal cell phone. And so there was a pounding on her hotel room door, two guys with weapons, you know, she had to escape out the back, she got a silent phone, and it solved the problem because it was encrypted from her phone out to our servers in Montreal. And then it, she was either doing end-to-end -end secure calls with her editor in Manhattan, and that was end-to-end -end secure. Or if she was talking to someone else at the same newspaper, it was a normal PSTN call, but the gateway for bridging to the PSTN was in Montreal. And so it was from her smartphone in Damascus to Montreal. And then it was easily wiretapped from Montreal to New York. Well, she didn't care about that wiretap. She was in Damascus where people want to kill her, you know? So the threat was local. So sometimes um, even a little bit of security that just protects the content between where you are and your device to anywhere outside the, the theater of war it, it can, be, can be good. Now, that's not a whistleblower scenario. That's a war correspondent scenario. But sometimes when people are operating in physically dangerous environments, they need to communicate just to the outside world. And then if it gets wiretapped after that, who cares? You know, they're just making a public switch telephone network call, but from a place that the local regime can't reach. Yeah. Hi. Um, there's an um, anecdote by your hand on the internet about the time that you invented your first crypto system. Say that again. About the time that you invented your first crypto system, which turned out to be horribly insecure. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. That resonated very strongly with me because I'd made the exact same mistake a few months before. Yeah. Um, and I was also very um, proud of it and very smug and cocksure, I believe is the wording. Um, and my question is, is there a way that we can sort of um, protect the enthusiasm of amateurs working in the cryptography sphere <laughs> while also preventing crappy code from getting out there? Yeah. You know, I, I had a friend um, who worked at NSA, uh, Brian Snow. He's, he's been retired for many years now. Uh, Brian worked in the Information Assurance Directorate of the NSA. Those are the people that actually make the codes, not break them. He didn't work on the signals intelligence part of the, of the organization. He worked in the part. He was, he was like me, you know, he, he protects communication. And I, I met him in the early 90s, and um, right after I first published PGP. And, and he, he said that he would never trust a crypto system unless it was designed by someone who had spent years earning their bones by breaking crypto systems. Um, and I, I mean, that is so true. You know, <laughs> and that's where I failed because I mean, I had this really stupid block cipher that I developed at home. I called it the Bassomatic, and it was horrible. It was terribly embarrassing. And, and, I, and I had a, a, a real cryptographer look at it at the very same crypto conference where I met Brian Snow. It was, it was um, um, Ellie Beam who, who developed, uh, he did his, his PhD work on uh, differential cryptanalysis an attack on the DES. And so I had him look at the Bassmatic, and it, I, I spent like 10 minutes with him, and, I, and about nine minutes was explaining how it worked. And the last minute was him f showing weaknesses in it. And, and it was a very uh, humiliating experience, and that's when I decided I would never again try to design my own block cipher. But, you know, the context of today, at that time, there was no, you couldn't take any courses in, in, in crypto at that time. Um, I mean, you know, academic cryptography was just in a much earlier stage. I mean, when, 
back in the 70s when I was in college, there absolutely were no courses in crypto anywhere. There were, in fact, it was hard to even find textbooks in crypto. Um, and, and the textbooks that existed in the 70s just weren't, they were no, they were no good. Um, today, every university has crypto courses. Um, we, we, you know, there's, uh, back when, when I first started going to the IACR conferences in, in Santa Barbara, we used to gather around for a group photograph and you could take a picture of just this people, it was like 200 people, you know, maybe, maybe less than that, maybe 100. And <laughs> many years ago, they stopped taking those photographs because the, the, the attendance was much larger. There's now so many people that are competent in crypto. It's now part of our society. In the 90s, we had to fight hard to make it so that we could use strong crypto in industry, and, and we got that, we won that. And now, it's ubiquitous. It used to be you had to explain yourself if you were using strong crypto. You had to explain why did you need strong crypto? Are you a criminal? Are you a terrorist? Are you a drug dealer? Why do you need to hide your, your stuff? Today, the legislative environment has inverted from that. If you are not using strong crypto today, you have to defend yourself. If you're a clinic and you're not encrypting your patient records, you have to, you, you may be legally liable there because in the US we have our HIPAA laws, you have similar laws in most of the European countries. Um, if, you're, um, if you are in business and you have, um, let's say you have a laptop computer with a couple hundred thousand customer identities on the, on the disk and you leave it in a taxi, you better hope that it's encrypted because if it's not, you have to go public with that and reveal that you just lost 200,000 customer identities, you know, through negligence. And, you know, your crypto is your get out of jail free card. In the US, you just have to go public, which damages the company. In Britain, I think there's also additional uh, uh, civil and possibly criminal liabilities for that kind of breach. Um, so today, the legislative environment favors strong crypto. That's how far we've come. Now, at the time that we were fighting this war in the US, um, we had participation of every corner of society. It, you know, there was um, the Congress, there were the courts. I mean, we had litigation going on. There were three cases that were important litigation at that time. Uh, there were two civil cases. Uh, Phil Karn was suing uh, the U.S. government uh, to, for the right to uh, uh, export encryption. Uh, uh, Dan Bernstein was suing, suing them for um, including strong crypto in his coursework, which was going to be exported. And then there was the criminal case against me, um, which and actually, I wasn't prosecuted. I was not indicted. I was the target of a three-year criminal investigation. Uh, but I learned a lot about criminal law from that, you know? <laughs> it's like every time I watch an episode of Law and Order, I'm always saying, don't talk to the cops, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you get pretty good at criminal law when you're a, a target of a criminal investigation. Um, but I had a great legal team. Uh, in fact, one of the guys was Eben Moglen, who was active in the Free Software Foundation. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in fact, we had, uh, we had Kurt Carnow, who was, uh, uh, a, um, uh, an, a, he was a former prosecutor who did uh, intellectual property work. There was um, Ken Bass, who was uh, from a Washington law firm, and he worked in the Justice Department under Jimmy Carter. Um, on national security issues. We had a great legal team. And anyway, it was a, it was a great learning experience. We won that struggle, and, 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 and there, were, there was particip participation from journalists, from the FBI, from the NSA, from uh, the courts, from Congress, from academia, from civil, liber civil liberties groups, uh, and, you know, from every corner of society. And, the near consensus was that we needed to have strong crypto to drop the export controls in the US, to not have uh, domestic controls. The FBI was the one diehard that never let go of it. 
but everyone else, in fact, NSA backed away from it. And it, I, I always wondered at the time why the NSA gave up. Now I know, of course, it's very clear why, because they felt that they didn't need to stop strong crypto, because they realized that they could get what they needed by other means, by the uh, injection of malware in the computing platforms. Um, and so they backed away from that whole debate, and we thought we won, and you know we did win some important things, and that entrenched uh, strong crypto, and that gave rise to uh, you know a, a whole crypto industry, and you know created a lot of jobs in crypto and university courses in crypto. Now I mean this audience, many people in this audience have taken crypto courses. How many people here have taken crypto courses in university? So, you know, you can see how available that is, and it's largely because we prevailed in the 90s. So, yeah. Hey, all right. Hi, Phil. Uh, here is Marco from Italy. Um, so over the last years, we have seen an emerging growing in cryptocurrencies, like, you know, Bitcoin, Litecoin, and so on and so forth. So my question to you is, I mean, I would like to know your opinion about cryptocurrencies. So do you think uh, this type of technology would be useful like to normal users or would be more useful like uh, or abused by cyber criminals possibly? Uh, you know, um, it's funny. Uh, you know, Bitcoin can be used by criminals, but Bitcoin is not really anonymous. And so uh, it's not clear to me why criminals want to use a system that is not anonymous. I mean, cash is anonymous, but Bitcoin is not anonymous. So I don't know why, I don't know what, why criminals are attracted to Bitcoin. Um, I think what's more interesting about uh, cryptocurrencies is that um, some, of the, some of the techniques that were used to design them, in particular blockchain, can be used for other purposes, other interesting applications. And uh, I mean, for example, um, one of the things that I'm interested in these days is PGP was designed 25 years ago, or more than 25 years ago, and the threat model from 25 years ago was different than it is today. It was, it was a much, much less complex threat model. And um, today, I think it's time to update PGP's um, method of, of um, protecting uh, public keys, uh, to, to certify public keys. And I think that we can use some of the techniques. There's a project called Conix, K-O-N-I-X, no, I'm sorry, K-O-N-I-K-S, that uh, uses um, Merkle trees and uh, uh, may, I think it has, I think it uses blockchain. Uh, it, it's, it certainly uses Merkle trees. And, and it, it, it's a way of having a, a public key registry that presents a kind of um, uh, coherent picture of, of, who, of which keys are, have been signed by uh, someone who signs keys. It's like key transparency. And I think that's an interesting technique that could be brought to bear to upgrade PGP's trust model. Um, so I, I'm, I'm interested in that. I, in fact, I'm talking with somebody who's working on that. So um, that's, uh, it, there's other things I'd like to do to bring PGP up to date. The original PGP, I'm sorry, this is digressing from your point about cryptocurrencies, but it kind of connects to, to uh, another thread of conversation here. PGP's original design never took into account the vulnerability of your keys on your laptop computer because in 1991, when PGP first came out, nobody was connected to the internet all the time. I mean, yes, you could have workstations in universities that might be connected to the internet a lot, but the more typical scenario, and when PGP was first released in 1991, was that you had a PC and it was connected by a modem that once in a while you would dial the modem to uh, pick up your email. In fact, a lot of people were using uh, electronic bulletin board systems at the time. They weren't even using the internet. But the ones that did use the internet would only occasionally dial in. There was no World Wide Web. There were no web pages. You would occasionally dial in with your modem. You would fetch your mail 
you know, with pop protocol, and you would download it, and then, you know, it, with PGP, you could encrypt and decrypt email. But you're connected to the internet for like a minute or two minutes to do this. And you didn't have to worry about when you're sleeping at night that somebody's going to reach into your computer from the other side of the world and, you know, do a port scan and try to get into your laptop so they could steal your, your private key and then exhaust your passphrase. Um, that was not part of the threat model. And yet today, we have to worry about that. In fact, today, all kinds of crypto protocols that involve servers have to worry about the exfiltration of private key material from the server. You know, TLS private keys on servers can be exfiltrated because, you know, the server's on 24-7. An SSH uh, private key on a server could be exfiltrated. Um, so the servers are constantly available. And, and laptops are connected almost all the time to the internet now. And so, what is, the, what is the likelihood that your PGP key will, will be safe? The private component of your PGP key will remain safe for years at a time. It's, it's unlikely. The threat model today is much worse than it was 25 years ago. So we have to find a way to do something about that, maybe with hardware assistance. You know, it, we, a lot of our mobile devices, you know, the iPhone has a, uh, a secure, uh, hardware secure enclave. Now, that's great for your phone, and maybe you could put a key in there, but I have a PGP key I'd like to use on more than one platform. And so, <clears throat> it's a much more complex threat model now. So we need to upgrade the PGP trust model, and we need to, in, in, in the case of PGP, we also need to find a way to protect the private key material for much longer periods of time, maybe with hardware assistance. Um, but your question was about cryptocurrency. I think that I find the most interesting thing about cryptocurrency is the, is the new techniques that it introduces. I, I'm, you know, I think blockchain could have a lot of interesting uses. Um, yeah. My question was one of the most famous aspects of PGP, the <coughs> uh, web of trust that was introduced by the key servers. And with the web of trust, you inherently leak the social graph of the users. That's right. And with the social network becoming more and more important, how yeah. do you think are the requirements set for protecting the social graph better? You know, when I designed the um, trust model for PGP, I, I didn't worry too much about the social network mapping. Uh, you know. <laughs> Things are so much worse today than they were then. <laughs> Actually, I took this position that, well, you know, anybody can sign anyone else's key, and it would be completely neutral, and you could sign the key of a mass murderer that you have no reason to trust, and all you're doing is merely asserting that this key belongs to this person. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I was looking at it with tunnel vision, you know, because I wasn't really thinking that, well, you're more likely to be signing keys of people that you know. And, and people that you hang out with. And, and that's, maybe that's not how key signing parties work because uh, key signing parties, they all come together and just sign each other's key indiscriminately, you know, just show, show your passport and get your key signed. Um, which, you know, maybe that would, maybe that would uh, be a weaker social network because you don't really know these people. There was an XKCD cartoon about signing someone's public key at a key signing party uh, without knowing who they are. Um, one of the problems with the PGP trust model is the cognitive burden. And in the late 90s, there was a paper published called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. And it was about the difficulty of the cognitive burden of the PGP trust model. It's hard to explain this to your mom you know, about what is a trust model, what is a trusted introducer, what's the difference between whether a key is valid, that it's been authenticated, or that the person who holds that key is, should be trusted to sign other keys. Um, that's cognitively difficult to explain to people. And because of that, it limited the spread of PGP. It reduced the network effect of PGP. And PGP still got used a lot more than SMIME, 
S-MIME didn't have that kind of grassroots trust model. It had a centralized trust model. But the activation energy for S-MIME was much higher. So S-MIME was bundled with Microsoft products. So it actually had a deployment advantage, but in a, in a kind of a static deployment sense, it was more widely deployed than PGP, but no one used it. Because to make it work, you had to build a PKI, you had to have a certificate authority, signing keys, and you had to have all that working as it, it was a big step function in activation energy to get started. And so SMIME was, um, was not getting much traction. Even though it had a big static deployment advantage, it wasn't getting used as much as PGP. And yet still, even though PGP had a much lower activation energy, it had a higher cognitive burden. And so that's, neither of them got very much um, um, network effect. So we have to overcome that. And I think there is a way to overcome that with some of these new techniques I was describing earlier about um, key transparency and a, a public key registry that could make it so that there's a lower cognitive burden to using PGP, and then that could mean that the numbers could go far higher. I think today there's only a few million PGP users, uh, but you know WhatsApp has a billion users. So WhatsApp has a very low cognitive burden because you don't really deal with the trust model very much. But still, WhatsApp has its, uh, its social graph leaked to one <coughs> company, more or less. Yeah. Yeah, Facebook has plenty of social graph stuff. <laughs> it's their whole business model. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, one question I wanted to ask. Uh, you were um, just... Uh, the, the, the examples for uh, surveillance that you mentioned, they were real-life examples. Um, for me, uh, the areas where uh, surveillance is visible or uh, the most is Internet. Right? When I'm online, I get uh, watched all the time by yeah. several institutions. Now, um, <coughs> I realize that doesn't necessarily have bad consequences or as bad consequences as real life surveillance, but it's already here and it's happening. That's right. Yeah. So um, what's your opinion on uh, the relative dangers of online surveillance and real I, life surveillance? Well, I, um, yeah, online surveillance can lead to quite dystopian results because, uh, you know, if you, if you keep, um, um, if you have data retention laws that require internet service providers to keep a record of all the websites you visit. Um, you know, the, there's Compromat there, right? Um, I, you know, I saw, <laughs> I saw one of these, you know those medical bracelets you wear that's, you know, that if you, that if you, if you, uh, if you have a medical emergency, it says that you're a diabetic or something like that, or that you're allergic to this drug, or, or that your blood type is this, or something like that. And I saw one of these bracelets that's, <laughs> You know what to do. You know, said, uh, delete my browser history. <laughs> so um, we can't just delete our browser history now because ISPs, uh, at least in Europe, um, are required to do data retention for a long time, and that's that's terrible. Um, not everybody can use a VPN to solve that problem. I, I think that, I mean, you know, one of the earlier questions was, well, what technical countermeasure can we do to certain kinds of surveillance? But a lot of it, we need, uh, we need public policy solutions. We need to not save the browser history. Or, I'm sorry, the, the, um, the you know, the, the ISP saving every, all the traffic that, you, that you've done. That's... Or, or it, I mean... Especially with these very long periods of time, you know, I mean, that's, that's, it, it can get really bad if stuff that you did a year ago is, is subject to review now. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's sadly clear that a lot of the problems we do have today need policy solutions. 
but in but where do you still see possibilities to do things better than they are right now? For example, how to prevent weak implementations of otherwise proven crypto algorithms or how to improve the usability of the tools to to induce wider 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 use of uh, of it which also generates more encrypted traffic and thereby yeah uh, also makes traffic well, analysis more difficult there are i mean th there are some good technical things that we should be doing i mean um, opportunistic encryption of all your web browsing using https for everything and um you know i, I th there's this uh, um um let's encrypt initiative to try to get make to get SSL certificates everywhere. The, although I have to say the Let's Encrypt initiative has also created um, opportunities for uh, bad guys to impersonate, uh, you know, banks or, or whatever. You know, they just get a Let's Encrypt thing and since those certificates are, are the, the top level certificates are, are now in the browsers, you have a failure of, of PKI can fail, even though you, it sounds good, let's do the let's encrypt thing, but it, it creates another serious opening of the attack surface. Um, it also reduces the attack surface by having more ubiquitous TLS, but it also increases the attack surface in that somebody could dupe, they, they can fool the, the let's encrypt certificate authority to sign keys that they shouldn't sign. I think that, that we need something better than that. We need to have um, something like uh, key transparency or other kinds of things to, to uh, make it so that you can't have uh, bogus certificates. We also need to do across the board uh, upping our game. We need to get rid of old um, crypto suites, obsolete crypto suites. You know, um, a lot of TLS stacks have, you know, <laughs> Uh, 56-bit DES and uh, you know RC4 and other things that you know they have things in there that are vulnerable. They support TLS 1.0, SSL. You know they TLS 1.1. We should get rid of all that. In fact, TLS 1.3 is where we need to be. We should all switch to TLS 1.3. And and that's just on the TLS side. I mean, there's lots of other things too. We need to have ubiquitous encryption. And that's part of, you know, we shouldn't be fighting government officials that are trying to discourage uh, the deployment of end-to-end -end, uh, secure communications. It should be everywhere. It should be, we need all the help we can get. But even if we do that, this, the, the big cybersecurity picture is, is still a disaster. In fact, um, I, I think that to a certain extent, uh, it's diminishing returns on encryption because we're, we're not doing enough to protect the platforms from um, malware injection. If somebody takes over in, your computer, in fact, when, when I was screwed. asking my question, I was kind of fishing for what you are about to do uh, with the developers you're looking for. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I said that I'm looking for volunteers to, I'm working, I'm going to. Uh, work on another secure communications project and I and I and I'm going to open source uh, most of it um, and uh, I need to I need volunteers to help me with that can't pay anything but it'll be it's it's fun <laughs> or at least maybe maybe there'll be a way to pay later if there's a way to get uh, something that happens later <laughs> Other than being fun, is there still already some uh, some hard facts available uh, about how and what direction it's going to go? Say that again. Uh, are there some uh, some hard facts available in what direction this development is going to uh, go? You know, I, I'd like to do I'd like to do something like uh, actually the competitive picture is is um, it, there's more competition today. I only got a couple of minutes left. There's more competition today for secure communications. I mean, now there's a billion users of WhatsApp. And, you know, I can't just do silent phone again. I, I, there has to be something better than that. Uh, but I'd like to do more secure communication. I'm not done yet. Hi. Uh, how do you counter the argument that if, you've got no, if you're not doing anything wrong, you've got nothing to hide? 
that's, that's absurd. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, um, that's like saying, um, you know, if, if you don't have anything to say, then you don't care about free speech. Uh, You know, there's herd immunity. You know, it's like you say, well, I don't need this vaccine. You know, there's some anti-vax people that, I, I mean, I think anti-vax is insane. You know, we should all get vaccinated against diseases. But um, the argument that, well, uh, my children don't need to be vaccinated. And that, that's none of your business, it's my children. No, there's herd, herd immunity. And so, analogous to that, there's herd immunity about free speech, there's herd immunity about everyone using uh, secure communications, there's herd immunity about public expectations of what we should all be doing about protecting our privacy. That's, that's a classic herd immunity mechanism. Uh, I, I made this point in 1991 with, when PGP first came out. I said that, think of it as a form of solidarity. And so the same argument applies today. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please give a huge round of thanks to Phil Zimmerman. By the way, I just want to ask a question. I was 37 years old when I published PGP for the first time. And how many people here are less than 37 years old? Yeah, so pretty much like almost, almost everyone, right? How many people here are younger than PGP? How many people were born after 1991? Okay. Yeah? All right. So, thanks. Thanks for your time. <laughs>